Hey there, everyone. Welcome to episode five of the main episodes, uh, the the main shows proper of the Dark Parade. Thanks very much for all the feedback. Thanks for listening to all the episodes in our Psycho series. Uh, I thought that was all a tremendous amount of fun. I learned a lot about those movies. Uh, as I do doing this show, that's one of the things I like about it is, uh, you know, I say it kind of as a, a joke in some of these episodes, but only half jokingly, that I hope you exit these episodes a little smarter than when you entered them uh, in regards to the movies that we're talking about. And so for the second series of movies, I wanted to do something that was a little more fun, a little less heady. Not that, you know, Psycho 3 and 4 are necessarily the most complicated of movies, but uh, I would say that the, the series in front of us is even less complicated, and I'm talking about the Night of the Demon series. And there are three films in the uh, initial series, and then there is a remake. We're going to be covering all four of those with a, a variety of hosts. And the first one up is uh, my friend Mark Ball, who I've worked with a bunch on the summer series. You'll hear us talk about this, but we never got an opportunity to work together just mono e mono before, and uh, very much wanted to. So uh, there we go. We are doing the first Night of the Demons. We've got other hosts on the uh, on the other episode, so I think you'll enjoy it. I know I have. It's been a, a great deal of fun. And I have a weird sort of reverence for these movies, um, maybe because of the time in which I saw them. Uh, they are not necessarily... I mean, they're B-movies to be sure, but I don't know. There's something a little special about these, and, and I think as we talk about them, I think we start to get to the bottom of what it is about these movies that put them, you know, a little bit... Uh, a few notches above uh, some of the other movies of this type that came out around the same period. And it isn't just Linnea Quigley bent over uh, in a grocery store. So, anyway, thanks again for listening. Uh, I'll be back on the the back end of this conversation. So, uh, enjoy Night of the Demons with Mark Ball. And welcome, as always, to The Dark Parade. All right, so Night of the Demons, let's let's get into it. With me to discuss the first of the Night of the Demons films is one Marcus Ball. I don't even know that's, I don't think it's really Marcus. Uh, <laughs> it, it, it actually is. I get asked that a lot. If it, Usually if it's spelled with a K like mine is, it's just Mark. And if it's with a C, it's Marcus. But yep, just, just the Mark. I just like extra syllables. That's all. You and a lot of other people, evidently, which I'm totally okay with. I've been called much worse things, believe me. Marcus Ballas, his Roman name. <laughs> <laughs> but first of all, thanks for doing this. And, and second of all, uh, we'll, we'll do this a little more on the back end. But uh, tell the people where you're from. What are your bona fides other than having been podcasting for, what, 30, 40 years now? Oh God, it feels like a hundred. <laughs> no, I've, I've been at, I've been at this uh, like pretty close to a decade, like kind of on and off. Uh, but I I kind of got my start. Well, I did my own show that was really really bad, like about ten years ago. But uh, then I kind of hooked up with the the deviants over on the Midnight Horror Show and was with them on and off for. I mean, that show's come and gone so many times, like it's kind of ridiculous but uh yeah that 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 show like got started like i think like about 11 years ago now and i joined on like year one or year two uh right now my main podcast jam is doing nasty over with duncan on the the teapots cast of uh side podcasts to the podcast under the stairs there were like about halfway through the tier three list of the video nasties so uh yeah we're, we're we, we we've been doing that for i think like about a year and a half now so we got about another year and a half of those left but uh yeah you, you can find me over there i love doing guest spots i'm really i'm really stoked to, i don't think you and me have ever recorded a show where it was just you and me we have like, i no. think we, yeah. we, we've been on a lot of like the the, the teapot summer series round tables I don't know if you remember this, but I was on like an episode or two of Devour the Podcast like a long time ago. And I distinctly remember those because those were really bad recordings for me. I don't remember why exactly, but I remember one of the movies we were talking about was Carrie and I came on and I just, for whatever reason, didn't have a whole lot to say about Carrie. I'm not a huge fan of that one, or at least I wasn't at the time. I bet you if I came back around to Carrie now, I'd probably 
like it a lot more than I did back then. But I felt really bad because you guys were nice enough to invite me out as a guest, and I just kind of fucked it all up and was just like, I don't have a lot to say about this. I know that's the whole reason you brought me on to be a guest is to say things, but I don't have a lot to say here. But anyway, that's that's probably almost a decade ago. So that's that's water under the bridge. And yeah, like I said, I love doing guest spots, man. I'm really. Uh, stoked to be here on this one this, especially for Night of the Demons this seems like a very Mark Ball kind of movie it's got a lot of a lot of things about it that <laughs> remind me I, I don't know necessarily of myself but just like my kind of general taste in uh, like movies and horror and music and Halloween and stuff like that in general this is a very me kind of movie so I'm fucking pumped to be here man thanks man I, yeah I, and we haven't done anything just one on one and we have so much fun when we do the summer series together that yeah. I, I definitely wanted to have a show that was just us goofing off and Night of the the, the whole reason I want to do the Night of the Demon series is because I have a weird affection for, for these movies and I'll go ahead and tip my hand a little bit right now i don't think the original night of the demons is the best one in the series really i, I think i've only seen the first two i think well I'll, we'll get to it later in the series but i actually i think i prefer the second one to this one just because it goes more places right by which i mean like actual physical sets um but that's true this one's pretty confined it very much is but i do kind of love this movie and just earlier today i was listening to the commentary with um steve johnson and kevin tenney and uh i can't think of the uh hal harness is that his name hal havens who plays stooge and kathy podwell uh, who plays judy it was the four of them doing it right and uh, the thing I learned is that everything you think about this movie is exactly what it is. It was the least surprising director's commentary I may have ever listened to. <laughs> uh, I mean, there's nothing, nothing really wrong with that. It's a, it's a pretty, it's a fairly straightforward kind of spooky haunted house movie, I guess you'd say. Like, uh, I don't know. I, I would love to, you know, this has pretty great special effects. I would love to have, you know, learned some, which maybe we'll bring up on the show a little bit later. Some little, little factoids about production, but uh, yeah. Yeah, so let's get into this. Uh, the The basic story begins uh, kind of le- Lethal Weapon 2 style, where it just jumps into a car and off we go. Uh, right. Except there's not, you know, Mel Gibson calling anyone sugar tits and banging on the roof of the car. <laughs> yet thank thankfully oh oh yet is, is that happened in one of the sequels god yeah, I fucking hope not. I, I, like you said you haven't seen neither demons three so it's kind of <laughs> at this point it's sort of schrodinger sequel it, it can <laughs> oh, it no. both has and doesn't have a mel gibson cameo all at once <laughs> but so we're introduced to uh three of our main characters right here which is stooge who is a guy wearing a pig nose and has some I kept ha- wanting to call him Piggy in my notes. Like my first couple notes on this, I call him Piggy, and I was like, wait a minute, that's that's Lord of the Flies. That was a completely different movie. <laughs> that is a very different movie. <laughs> uh, and then you have Helen, uh, who is not terribly relevant to the film other than she's in it and then eventually dies. And Roger who is the black guy yeah and it's kind of a shame that's like his whole character practically (laughs) he's he's the black the token black guy he's the token black guy and easily the most cowardly character in the film which is also kind of unfortunate but i guess for him every movie kind of needs a coward he's easily he's like the ben cooper of this movie almost only not quite as big of a jackass yeah, yeah, it it would just be nice. I mean, again, th- this is looking at it through 2021 eyes, but it's like, yeah. why have the one black guy in your movie be the one who's just like, you know, screw everyone else, I'm out to save myself. That's true. Uh, but yeah, such is life. So uh, they're on their way to a party at Hull House, which is uh, at a local mortuary. And we get a, a setup for the payoff uh, uh, at the end of the movie 
where they pass by uh, a dude who is coming back from the grocery store, an older man, carrying apples and razor blades. And oh, yeah. I almost forgot about this. this. This comes back around at some point in the movie, so it's kind of important. Yeah, and Stooge flashes his pumpkin underwear clad ass at the guy. <laughs> Which is pretty great. So they're, they're totally driving the the car from Return of the Living Dead too. It's like an old jalopy that's been spray painted a zillion times. There's probably a hundred beer bottles floating around in the back seat. It's it's very much like cars that I rode in in high school, except for maybe the spray paint part because you don't want to. Uh, that that's counterintuitive. You don't want to attract the attention of like the police and shit if you're driving around drunk and stuff. But. My, uh, I digress. My buddy Ben, speaking of digressions, he had an old <laughs> VW bus. And because it wasn't eye level and would not typically attract the attention of Johnny Law, as we called it back in the uh, the old days, <laughs> 5-0, um, he, he had a spray painted free sex on the top <laughs> of the VW minivan that he had. <laughs> It's pretty good. Like, like on the roof or on yeah, the ceiling? On the roof. So <laughs> if you were driving the, the minibus and you were like someone happened to be on the second floor of any building, it was clearly visible. <laughs> That's fucking hilarious. I mean, v- V-Dub buses are, are meant to be painted, whether it's a mural or like a very creepy, you know, <laughs> luring sexual type of thing like they, those vehicles are meant for that kind of I feel like yeah yeah we there were a lot of shenanigans in in that minibus as you can imagine um but yeah you're right like it does have that kind of old beater kind of car vibe which i like like there's a lot of little details in the, this movie i like and the, that car is, is one of them i also kind of like the fact that there is this weird wraparound story with this old man with his razor blades and because yeah. you forget about it by the end of the movie and then you're like oh right the guy with the razor blades fair enough uh. so <laughs> then we uh cut to judy who is really the main character of the film and she's like the most pure of the group kind of she's she's almost like uh she's a little bit like Lori and halloween or you know like the you know the, the, the typical, I, I don't know if necessarily she's a virgin, but that's kind of the, uh, you know, she, she's the good girl of the group. Right. If this were the Kamet in the woods, she would be the virgin role for sure. Yeah. Um, but yeah, and she goes home. She Her little brother jumps out of her closet while she's changing clothes because he's a little pervert creep. There's a lot of that in 80s horror, and I don't understand, like, where that comes from exactly. But, you know, five seconds on Pornhub, you'll you'll realize that that didn't really go away. <laughs> what in the hell is going on in this country? The fact uh, that, I don't... <laughs> that, yeah, as soon as you type in anything in Pornhub, it's like, oh, stepmother? It's the, you want a, a stepbrother or a stepsister? Like, are you sure you don't want to look at a step milf instead of just a milf? Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, I'm just... like, no. <laughs> I mean, I, I never had step parents or step siblings to lust after, so I mean, maybe that's part of it. Look, I had a series of stepmothers because my dad was adventurous like that. Right. But nary a one did I ever think, like, you know what? I think I got a shot. We got a lot of weird, weird repressed things in this country, I think is kind of the long and short of it. Yeah, yeah. The... <laughs> You mean a country started by a bunch of Puritans has repression issues? <laughs> yeah, don't say. That sounds weird. Um, but yeah, so <laughs> Judy is getting ready for this party. She, or Her boyfriend, Jay, who is this fret boy knucklehead, is like, hey, babe, let's go to Angela's party. And she's like, you mean that creepy goth chick? And I'm like, go on. <laughs> That's <laughs> them's my ladies. Uh, uh-huh. And, but, uh, you know, eventually she kind of gives in. There's also some business with her ex boyfriend or just a friend that is a little too chummy, uh, named Sal, who shows up. 
and he's trying to pay off Judy's younger brother to find out where this party is that Judy and Jay are going to. But this all starts with him showing up to be like, hey, how about you tell your sister I got a pet snake for her to play with? <laughs> and you're like, what in the fuck is going on here? And thankfully, he's a shithead little brother. He's like, basically tells him to kick rocks or whatever. He's like, come on, kid, I'll give you a shiny quarter if you tell me where your sister's going to be. He's, I, I can't remember what the line is, but yeah, he's just like, a quarter? You think I'm going to sell out my sister for a quarter? And then he pulls out a dollar, and it's like, oh, yeah, well, I mean, I guess this was the 1980s. Probably going to bought like five comic books, ten hot dogs, and a fucking Snickers bar for a dollar, but... Yeah. Anyway, a Nintendo Entertainment System costs three dollars <laughs> and seventy five cents. If if you would have pulled out a fiver, you could have bought an island in the Philippines <laughs> at, at this point. In yeah, in, in money money wise, yeah, it, it it has the same value as Bitcoin does today. <laughs> Fucking Am- Amazon stock, right? So. Uh, yeah, so they're all going up to Hull House where there's going to be this big Halloween party. Um, also worth pointing out, there is an entire scene with Angela and Suzanne. Angela is the, the girl hosting the party. Suzanne is her friend played by Linnea Quigley, uh, very famously. And this starts with a shot of just Linnea Quigley's ass. <laughs> Bent over. Yeah. Because, I mean, this movie kind of knows what it is, which is, <coughs> hey, we're going to be this kind of, you know, TNA-ish, you know, gory, campy horror film. It, it knows what it is. Like, it, it's it's not ashamed of it, which, you know, I, I, I respect that very much. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it's the old Robin Williams line from Dead Again. Decide what you are and be that. Um, yeah. But yeah, so huh, while all the while the two guys behind the counter are staring at Linnea Quigley's ass, uh, Am- uh, Amelia Kincaid, who plays uh, Angela, is just rolling through this place with like a pillowcase, <laughs> <laughs> just throwing in like cookies and chips and some soda, like it she is shoplifting like she is about to host a a party at a roller rink you know it's no booze there's no cigarettes or anything it is the most like clean cut uh party (laughs) that turns into you know a festival of demonology or whatever but it's not the way it starts she, wa- she walks out very casually with all this, too, because she can clearly see that these dudes are still ogling Lin- Lin- Linnea Quigley's ass. And, uh, yeah, it's, it's not like a snatch and run kind of thing with, with Angela. She, she's very, very casually just like robbing the store blind. And uh, I, I, I love the line that Linnea Quigley says. It's like she, she sees Angela walking out the door. She turns to the guys at the counter. It's like, Hey, you guys got sour balls? I don't know what that accent is, but I, I, I'm trying here. You're like, you're like, like Rich Little, yeah. <laughs> they're like, no, we don't. She's like, oh, must be hard. You must not get very many blowjobs. And just walks out and it's like, yes, this is the Linnea Quigley that I love. The one that just like gives absolutely no fucks. And uh, that realizes very much so that she's a sex object to like, not just people in the movie, but the audience also maybe. And she's just, she fucking owns it like so well especially in this movie i think like uh but yeah that's it's such a great way to introduce your characters yeah and linnea quigley had done movie plenty of movies before this where she was nude and even full frontal nudity and so forth so yeah she just understood like hey people are gonna be checking out my goodies and that's just gonna be part of this character uh, yeah, she kind of she made a whole career just doing that, like, at least for a while there. Oh, for sure. Like, if you needed somebody to get naked in your horror movie, Linnea Quigley was going to be game for it. Uh, which, you know, more power to her. Like, own that shit, you know? Yep. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. And so, uh, Jay, and then there there's a dude named Max and Franny pick judy up 
and Max is a guy dressed up like a surgeon. He's with, uh, is she dressed like a nurse? Is that what Franny's dressed up as? Are they couple, couple outfitting this thing, I think? I I kind of forget, but yeah, I think she's supposed to be a nurse. There, there's a couple of these characters that barely do anything like towards the beginning of this. Like I didn't realize until about halfway into this movie that Roger had a girlfriend. Like she, she she's the pardon the phrase she's the Asian girl of the group. Correct? That's Roger's girlfriend. No, that's uh, I thought that was Max's girlfriend. Oh, maybe you're. Right. I think Roger's flying solo here. Uh, okay, they they kind of get in like the same room, I think, basically later on in the movie. So I guess I just assumed that they were uh, boyfriend and girlfriend. They all have kind of generic names. Probably doesn't really help at all, all that much either. Like Angela is like kind of the iconic character from this movie, so she's easy to remember. The rest of these people, I have a really hard time keeping their fucking names straight, or like who is who, sort of. So and uh, like Judy, like uh, yeah, she's she's kind of the other one that like is kind of the only one that really stands out well and Linnea quickly obviously but uh, I'm really bad with the names I guess is what I'm trying to get at here really bad well and Judy's dressed up like Alice from Alice in Wonderland which also kind of helps it it both sells that innocence idea and also just makes her distinct from the rest of the group that are like generic doctor guy and pirate you know stuff like that 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 kind of stuff i i don't think lands real well but well and stooge Stooge is a pig that 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 one is very appropriate yeah i mean stooge is the other character that you're like well i ain't forgetting stooge in this movie um because he's just a, a real piece of shit from front to back but yeah so they they go to a whole house when they show up there um, Max is the one who kind of tells the legend of Hall House, which is that it was a, a mortuary. There was supposed to be, you know, satanic rituals conducted there and that evil spirits are in the house, but they can't escape Hull House because there's an underground stream that runs around the building and he puts his stethoscope to the ground. He's like, yep, there it is. Uh, there, I can hear the the water flowing underneath, and that means that spirits can't get away. There's a, there's also a line about how old man Hull House apparently was like a little too friendly with his clientele, which is a funeral home. So there's a little bit of implied necrophilia going on there. Yeah, <laughs> right. Doesn't well, doesn't really come to any any kind of fruition, but like, yeah, I, I think they just felt the need to throw that in there for, for a reason. Yeah, it, well, it's it just paints him as what you could say is not a great guy. You know, you don't right. like. It's one of those things. If you learn that about somebody, like, well, I like to have sex with corpses, you just immediately think like, oh, you're a dirtbag. Okay. <laughs> yes, this is true. <laughs> you know, it's not like it's the the exact opposite of when somebody tells you that like they're in the Bigger Brother program or something. Yeah, we do a lot of charity work. <laughs> yeah. Well, I give out, you know, presents to all the poor kids in our community at Christmas, and I dress up like Santa Claus. And, yeah, that, like yeah, that. The other guy's like, hey, yo, I run a funeral home. I like to diddle the corpses. You're like, ugh. I'll tell you what. I go through, like, 40 gallons of lube a month. And, <laughs> and only 30% of that is for work. Yeah. <laughs> Oh God! Uh, I don't know why you anyway. had a southern accent there, but you know. Um, but yeah, so there's uh, we we get a, a quick setup where somebody hands Judy a Jesus. lighter. You okay? Yeah, my cat knocked my phone off the fucking desk. I'm glad it didn't hang up the call. <laughs> Sorry about that. No problem, stupid cat. Um, <laughs> Fuck. <laughs> um. But yeah, so Judy is trying to light some candles and it turns out that she is using this lighter that's almost out of fluid. I mentioned that now because that's going to pay off later. And then there's a, uh, like the, the power goes out in this place and Angela's like, hey, I got a better idea. How about we do a seance where we all sit cross-legged in front of this mirror and you, it's a past life seance is, is the way she puts it where we're going to sit around, look into this mirror and when it goes black, we're going to see our 
what we look like in a past life. Right. And so they all start doing that. And then I think it might be Sal who's like making fart sounds or something behind him. <laughs> Whatever he's doing, just fuck it off. And it, but before he does that, the mirror goes black, but we don't see anything. And that's why Angela's like, you dumbass. Like, we almost had a spiritual connection here and you ruined it. But meanwhile, Helen, don't get used to her. She is looking at the mirror still and sees like a demon head in the oh, mirror. Oh, yeah, that's right. And she's like, oh, my God, it's a demon. And she freaks out and also sees herself dead uh, in this mirror. And then the mirror falls over and breaks into a million pieces. And this is where we get the coolest shot of the movie. Oh, yeah. All the, all the pieces of the broken mirror on the floor and everybody's just like looking down at it. And it's like you can you can see the group of them like all huddled together. But yeah, it's just like little splinters of glass like on the floor. That is such a cool shot. Yeah. And one of the interesting things that came out of that director's commentary is Kevin Tenney said that uh, it was a real stupid idea to do that shot because they were I bet it was a bitch to get right yeah he said it it took half a day to get that (laughs) shot oh god and they were on such a tight schedule that if the shot had not come off which he was under no illusions that it was going to for sure that they just wouldn't have had coverage for (laughs) that day oh boy right so uh but it it turned out it's a great shot and yeah the one thing that I will hand this movie is that there are some great uh, lighting and and shots in the film that yeah, make it absolutely. look it, it looks way better than the run of the mill, you know, kind of eighties monster movie that it is. Uh, yeah, totally. If you're into like shadow and like yeah, just like I wouldn't even call this minimal. I, mean, I guess it's minimal lighting, but they just really know how to yeah, just like make 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 things seem way bigger than they are and way creepier than they are. Just like with like really simple like kind of I don't even know how to describe it. Really, it's, it's just a lot of like you know lack of light and like knowing like where to throw your shadows kind of i i think this is like a beautiful movie to look at if you're into that kind of shit absolutely and like shooting a lot of lights through uh through slats in the wall and that kind of thing that like real and also just pumping rooms full of smoke to make sure that those lights are visible those slats of light falling and stuff uh it looks really good and but anyway so uh when, while they're all standing around this kind of main room the demon comes out of the furnace in the crematorium and it's a like a steady cam shot very evil dead like of coming out of the the furnace and going upstairs and kind of moving around the room and there's a little bit of kind of mythology uh in the series established here which is Hey, if the demon is in the room, it's real stinky. Yeah. I think it's cold kind of too, I think. Yeah. And I appreciate that. I like the fact that the demon uh, smells like a fart. That's kind of fun. Makes, it makes sense. Especially if it's a real evil demon. Yeah. Which is what I'm going to start calling my... <laughs> after eating something that makes my stomach a little upset. I'm like, oh, I got an angry demon. He's trying to come out. Somebody call an exorcist. I got... <laughs> I've been possessed by a foul scent. <laughs> so, uh, but yeah, everyone is, kind of is looking at each other like, what is that smell? And why, yeah, why is it so cold in here? And meanwhile, the demon goes in Linnea Quigley's mouth. Yep. And at this point, Angela, Angela, Angela is, is, is like, hey, we should probably get out of here because everything that we're talking about, like all these weird smells and the cold spots and Helen said she saw this demon and all that stuff, all of that to me sounds like demons. And we don't want any part of that. Ghosts are one thing, but demons are another. And then somebody's like, hey, what's the difference between ghosts and demons? (laughs) Ah, screenwriting 101. Yeah. And she says, well, ghosts are people that have died. 
demons are spirits that have never been human. They're just evil. And they're like, oh yeah, that does sound bad. So Helen in particular is like, let's go. And Roger uh, is going to go with her and they take Angela's car key. Angela, she is not pleased about. No, at, not at all. And but meanwhile, Jay is like, "Well, I mean, if we're, it seems like a shame to break up the party right now. Don't don't you think so, Judy? How about like we get naked in one of the rooms in this filthy house?" <laughs> Another another '80s trope is yeah, dudes wanting to have sex with their girlfriends in the grossest, scummiest fucking places imaginable. I don't, I don't, don't understand it, but whatever. Yeah, they. I mean, they have already discovered coffins in this joint. They know that it used to be a, a funeral home, and so at best, everything is really dirty and just covered in piss and shit from rats and bugs and other people who have come into this house to party. Uh, and that's a best case scenario. And now we got demons as well. Like, <laughs> uh, but old, old boyfriend, what's his face? Is he, he is not thinking about any of this. He just really wants to get into Judy's pants. For sure. And so uh, she goes off to, to look around. Stooge is kind of running off to look around. Um, and Suzanne is like, Hey Stooge, how about you come with me? But hang on before we go explore. Cause I'm going to lock lips with Angela here and kind of infects her with the demon as well. Yeah. That's, that's, that's one way of passing along this cursor or whatever. Yeah. It's just, just a lock lips. Yeah. And that seems to be it. Like you are either killed by the demon or the demon gives you a big mouthful of evil yep so that seems to be the two methods of transmission and uh but yeah so that you know a bunch of people are gonna go explore around the house because it's a horror movie and that's what we're doing like hey let's split up yeah <laughs> we can do more damage that way <laughs> and so max and franny our doctor and nurse couple decide that they're gonna go to the room where they found the coffin and have sex in the coffin because they haven't ever done that before. <laughs> Wait, has, has that thought ever crossed your mind in the in the years that you've spoke, spent on this planet? You're like, there would be like the fucking a coffin. No, I like. I feel like <laughs> I, I'm gonna have enough time in a coffin that I don't need to jump on that bandwagon uh, early. This, this, <laughs> this is very true. We got all all the rest of eternity you'd be worm food in a fucking overpriced box. Yeah. So, so I'm not so worried about that. Although, yeah, I mean, every now and again, I'll have those weird random thoughts where you're like, I wonder if it would be like to fuck in an airplane bathroom. And then right. I think that, and then immediately on top of that is, I think it would be uncomfortable and crowded. I don't think it'd be yeah, very yeah, much be, fun. Like, there's probably a reason I haven't done that yet. Yeah, and I mean, even if your partner of choice is willing to do it, it's still not a great idea. Yeah, you know, much like the coffin. Right, right. Because somebody is gonna like, oh, I got a cramp because I got to stick my leg over your shoulder <laughs> just so we can both fit in this fucking, you know, two by two toilet that we're in. Um, yeah, just ladies and gentlemen. If we can impart anything in the course of this episode, let it be that have sex in spacious places. You want to have sex outside? That's fine. Make sure, you know, no children are around. That's all we ask. But the the smaller yeah, the space, the worse an idea it is. Yeah, unless that's like a really specific kink of yours is to have sex in like a coffin or something. Like, yeah, you know, you, you can do better. You can do much, much better. <laughs> But see, that is just, as far as I'm concerned, that is just pre-necrophilia behavior. Yeah, kind of. When you're like, I, w I really want to fuck in this coffin. And you're like, why? Well, can you lie still when I do it? And also, uh, can you lower your body temperature about 25 degrees? 
which we, we we podcasters make a lot of well at least the ones that i hang out with make a lot of jokes about necrophilia but it was actually legitimately brought up during a Q&A after a movie that i was at a fantastic fest that corpses can't consent so that's like kind of not a cool thing to do i mean even if you're like a completely non-spiritual person and you know think that you know when you're dead that's it or whatever uh still kind of not cool so don't don't fuck corpses that's not okay yeah it's karmically a bad idea no matter how you slice it yep you don't have to see the movie necromantic to know that although (laughs) maybe you should maybe you should um just just so just so you have an idea of how like slippery a thing that you're talking about you know yep um also a corpse can't hug you back i've got that (laughs) t-shirt you have that on a t-shirt yeah and on the back it's (laughs) it's it's, it says the anti-necrophilia association of america huh where the fuck did you come in possession of such a thing in my imagination where all things live um Ah. yeah i (laughs) although god bless her if i told my girlfriend that i wanted that t-shirt there i don't think she would get it for me but she would totally see that as in line with my ethos <laughs> she's like oh bo what i get is you're a mess <laughs> i get that a, a lot a lot yeah i think i do too in, in, in so many words yeah I'm like yeah i know yeah i that and what is wrong with you I get that a lot too, <laughs> but it's an affectionate. What is wrong with you? You know? Yeah, yeah. There, there's a fine line where you should maybe be worried if they make that comment. It's it's all in the inflection and tone. Yeah, yeah. There's definitely a line because there. I, I'm not gonna say what it was that I told her, but there was a thing I told her recently that was just like, no, don't. I don't. That this is a conversation we don't need to have. I mean, shit just pops into your head sometimes. You just say it. I mean, that's that's part of living with other people's accepting that sometimes they're just gonna say shit. Yeah, for sure. And and like I said, she's she's the best. She is completely accepting of the dumbest of my behavior. I pre- <laughs> I appreciate her so much. But yeah, there are definitely moments where she she I'm the opposite. I'm like whatever you want to talk about. And she's a nurse, so she talks about like disgusting shit over dinner and stuff like that every now and again. But right. but every now and again, I will say something that is just, hey, here's this random thought I had. Isn't that funny? And she's like, no, that is that is what we call aberrant behavior, and <laughs> we're gonna we're gonna tap the brakes right there, and we're gonna pretend <laughs> that we didn't talk about this. <laughs> oh boy, we, we got way off the rails there for a minute. Night of the demons. Yeah, night of the demons. So. <laughs> After everybody has split up and is having sex in coffins and whatnot, that's where this all began. Um, so Jay is, finds a room and is like, hey, Judy, how about we get down? And she's like, look, that's not why I came here. And also, if the only reason that we came to this party is so that you could fuck me, um, you might be out of luck. And jay being a frat boy asshole does not take this well yeah because that like as you said his whole game here is just to get fucked that night so which is doing doing her disservice she's she's a nice young lady she's got i mean her little brother is a perv but like she looks like she lives in like a pretty good house like her family's got you know at least a little bit of money or whatever like you know you treat treat the treat your girl right don't fucking treat her like a fucking sex object like this dude totally had it coming to just get told uh well uh, you know i don't know if this is gonna work if this is all you're into and of course yeah he storms off like a huge baby and it's like this is where it's the audience you're like okay we want this guy to fucking die next and make it a good one because he's a piece of shit yeah that one of the things that you learn i think as you get older hopefully is that you know what you treat a woman right then she wants to fuck that's Mm -hmm. that's the secret is don't start with the fucking and the fucking will come uh anyway that's a different show um (laughs) (laughs) so that's legion after dark yeah right coming soon that's coming back next year um sweet yeah so while that's going down 
Roger and Helen are trying to get out, but they keep running into the same 20 feet of brick wall. Which apparently wraps around the entire place. Which, like, in, in any other movie, like, what Roger is doing out there, where he's basically like, I can't find the gate, it was right here, and he's, like, staring at a brick wall. That could be done really goofy. I don't know why on this viewing, that kind of creeped me the fuck out for some reason. Like, that's, like, a really simple way of being, like, uh, they're 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 kind of losing their minds, or the house is fucking with them on, like, a weird, you know, metaphysical level, kind of, because, like, you shouldn't just... You know, it should it should be hard to miss this giant, creepy gate that's at the front of this place. And yeah, I don't know, I don't know what it is about that, like him looking for that and just like seeming so lost and like out of it. Like it, that kind of creeped me out big time. This this go around, I, I can't quite put my finger on. It. It's got a kind of a Blair Witch vibe to it, of like yeah. you're you're just kind of lost and you should be making progress and getting away. But for some reason, you just end up in this, the same place you started. Yeah, it's scary because, I mean, it kind of happens in real life. Like, I, I mean, that's Blair, which is a great, great example. Like all kinds of people get lost out in the fucking woods all the time. And that's got to be such a terrifying feeling to be like the trail was right here. And now it's just nowhere and everything looks the same. And like, I'm starting to get scared because I'm fucking lost. Right, you have that second guessing of like, I think this is the right way back, but also all trees look alike. And, yeah. you know, maybe I'm headed the right way and I think I'm headed the right way, but I could also be second guessing myself into going the wrong way. And I guess this is like way, way creepier because they're like in a house. They're, they're like, you know, they're a little bit out in the countryside, I think, but it's not like the woods. Like, like I said, like you, you could, it's, I think it's pretty easy to lose like a trail or whatever, especially if it's dark. Losing a gate, that's like, oh boy, that's a bad sign for our fucking characters. There are bad things about to happen. For sure. Yeah. And, and I agree. I think there is a really unsettling thing about the notion of, there was a door right here and it's not here anymore and the laws of physics themselves are no longer applicable in this scenario yeah that's that's spooky man yeah and so helen is like fuck this i'm gonna stay in the car you give me a yell when you find uh a way out of here and so uh then she seems to be she's killed by some demon and he gets in the car for a second and is looking around for Helen, can't find her. And then her body just lands on the windshield of the car, which is a pretty good effect. It's pretty bloody and splattery when it hits the, the windshield, which I appreciate. It's good. It's good sound design, too. It was, it was like really startling because it gets kind of quiet, like right before that. Like the, like the jump scares, like a lot of it is all in the sound design. And there's a cheap way of doing it that, like, isn't very effective. And uh, there's a way like this one where, like, there's at least a little build up to it. And it does, like, genu- genuinely startle you, kind of. Yeah. Yeah. It's, yeah. There And there aren't a ton of jump scares in this movie, which is also how I prefer it. Like, a judicious use of jump scares as opposed to, well, that's just what the movie is. Right. Be- because at that point, it just becomes a theme park ride and it's not a movie. You get, you get numb to it after a while, too, if you overuse it. Oh, for sure. Uh, <laughs> see uh, the James Wan films, as far as I'm concerned. Um, uh-huh. But uh, then we have uh, a moment where Stooge, who has been led upstairs by Suzanne, gets locked out of the room she's in because she starts freaking out on him about, like, don't look at me! And kicks him out and he's just like what in the hell oh yeah she's she's got lipstick all over her she's drawing like a heart or something on her face and lipstick and yeah it's it's like clearly starting to lose her mind yeah yeah and we should just go ahead and talk about this whole effect because it's one of the (laughs) things i remember most about this movie when i think about this Uh, movie it's one of the things i think about it's the one everybody talks about for sure. This has got to be yeah, like the most. I, I don't. I don't know if you call this iconic. It's definitely the most memorable scene for this movie. I think it's the one everybody talks about with one eye quickly. Yeah, and so it's her uh, bare-breasted, 
and she's drawing, you know, basically a spiral around one breast, and she's got these hearts drawn in lipstick on her face, and then she just takes the tube of lipstick and pushes it into her left breast. Like, like right under the nipple, just like inserts it like it's a fucking CD drive or something. Did they say, did you get to the part of the audio commentary where they talk about this? Because I've always wondered, like, what the hell was the inspiration for this? They, I did, and they didn't talk about the why of it. This, I mean, it was in the script. So, I mean, Steve Johnson did talk about the how of it more than the why. But, right. you know, I... I I get the impression that it was just some weird gag that Kevin Tenney had come up with. And, but yeah, Steve Johnson, you know, uh, essentially said like, you know, he, we made this appliance and they did it with this, uh, kind of gel so that she could, you know, not only so it bounces back kind of like, so that the, it, the material. Yeah. And the lipstick tube itself was collapsible. So that as she's pushing it in, it's folding. Okay. But then she also puts her finger into the appliance. And <laughs> this is such a great touch. She just like tucks it in there, like one like knuckle deep with her fucking pointer finger. Yeah, and it's it's really it, it's a great effect. It looks really good, and it, it holds up super well because it's obviously a very practical effect. You know, it's just an appliance that they they put basically right below her neck and and down to uh yeah like she's behind it essentially right but it looks fantastic and it's also really unsettling because it is so weird and freakish and and like you said there's kind of that why of like why is she doing this oh my god why did <laughs> why is her body doing this it, it it's almost uh it's almost body horror and maybe it yeah. just is body horror, but uh, it's yeah, it's freaky. <laughs> I guess it's maybe a little, bit, a little bit better left unexplained because yeah, it is like nothing really. You, you, you got to go to some you know like Cronenberg or like Tetsuo kind of corners of the uh, the, the horror sphere to uh, you know even kind of understand where where's an idea. I'm sure yeah, it is just like some, something goofy that they came up. May, they might have been like looking. They might have had like a leftover like chest prosthetic like that and somebody was like hey there's like a little tear here hmm, i wonder if like somebody stuffed like that, that, that might have been an idea that, like was for something else that they never got around to using until this point or whatever but yeah i, I don't know fuck it i i kind of like it better left unexplained because it is one of the weirdest goddamn things in uh, a great many horror movies yeah oh for sure yeah and the inscrutability of it is one of the things because it doesn't like Linnea Quigley seemed so pleased with herself after it's done and you're like I don't know what is happening and that makes me feel a little uncomfortable because she's clearly not well because we've also seen her look into her mirror and her face go like super old and kind of stretch out and that kind of thing right and so while that's happening in the room Stooge wanders downstairs again where Angela starts doing a dance to a Bauhaus song. Oh, I love this scene. And this is one of the other big iconic scenes where she starts doing this dance for him and a strobe light starts going off. And the, one of the things I really dig about it is that it is... Uh, her kind of like crawling it's a very animal kind of performance uh, and they also do edits so that as the light flashes she'll suddenly be in a different part of the room dancing yeah yeah dude oh man and it, and Bauhaus is such like a oh man like this whole scene is just like a, a goth kids like wet dream like this probably this probably helped a lot of goth kids find their identity that grew up in spooky, I think, out of because it's, it's it's equal parts a little bit spooky, because, yeah, like you said, she kind of is, like, the strobe give, gives an unnatural look to everything, where she's kind of jumping around, but it's also super hot, like, uh, undeniably super fucking hot, so uh, yeah, I, I I kind of adore this, this scene. I love that song that they play, too. I can 
Uh, yeah, that's oh man, <laughs> so much to like about this scene. The uh, Steve Johnson, the uh, effects guy, said that uh, while they were on the shoot, he went to a uh, a strip club either just before or just after the shoot, and she was performing there. Um, really? Yeah, that she apparently she danced in some exotic clubs in and around Los Angeles. And he was like, yeah, she's fucking great. Like, you know, she has a real presence and that kind of thing. And um, he was like, yeah, it was like, you know, she was violent and it was really sexy. And she did her own choreography for all of this as well. So That makes sense. Yeah. So anyway, but... As, Sal comes downstairs and is like, hey, yo, this is real fucked up. <laughs> Your Sal voice. It's perfect. That's kind of what he sounds like, though. He's, he's a, a really stereotypical Italian character in this movie. Yeah. <laughs> like, hey, hey, go get your sister. Hey, are you going to... I think something really freaky is going on around here. I'm going to go get some fresh prosciutto. <laughs> that, that's that's Sal. He's he's a pretty one note, but you know he he's he's doing the best he can, I guess. And he's not the worst guy, as it turns out. But um, yeah. So uh, uh, finally, Angela is right in front of Stooge, and she starts kissing him, and she's got a demon tongue as this happens, and we understand. Like he starts trying to pull away from her so it's clear that he is being killed and or infected by this demon right and so stooge is now god angela's got suzanne's god and then uh jay shows up to find suzanne still mostly topless and also flipping her skirt up so we see some badge as well mm-hmm and he's like, oh, well, uh, I was here with Judy, but I think I know where my bread is buttered. <laughs> yeah, he, he switches gears real quick. Yeah. And so uh, he starts making out with her, and then she goes all demon on him and, and starts eating him. And so Jay gets killed by Suzanne. Then we have uh, Max and Franny who are fucking in the coffin and Stu shows up and he's all demoned out now and he breaks Franny's neck. He like whips her head around. Uh. And then uh, basically bangs off uh, Max's arm because he's trying to hide the coffin or whatever and his arm's sticking out. So that's right. Yeah, Stu just starts pounding that, and he dies that way. I was trying to remember how he died. I, I remember the, the the neck twisting is like it's kind of a neat effect for like a while ago, but I, I feel like it's kind of overused in a lot of horror stuff. The, the slamming his arm in the coffin and just like beating him to death with a coffin lid while he's in it, I think is kind of a cheat. That, that's like it's like something the Undertaker would do. <laughs> yeah, that one's pretty good. Um. Then there's oh, and I think it's uh, Jay gets uh, is is it his eyes is is that what where yeah because there's the whole love is blind gag later so Suzanne uses her thumbs to kind of gouge in his eyes that's how he that's gets right. it and so then uh, Roger and Sal run into each other and. Roger's like, hey, I can't find the gate, and also, uh, Helen's body fell on my car. And Sal's so like, hey, yo, there's something fucking crazy going on around here. <laughs> <laughs> and so they're, they're trying to find a way out. They find Judy still upstairs in the room where, um, Jay had left her. She was, like, locked in, basically. Yeah. And so they decide that they're going to escape and they're going out the roof is how they're escaping. And then Angela and a couple of the other demons show up 
and Sal ends up going off the side of the building along with Angela. And he gets like a, a picket fence stake through the chest is how he ultimately goes. But he kind of goes trying to distract them from uh, Judy. Yeah, it's, it's 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 a borderline noble death for, for a not very noble character up until that point, which I know is kind of a nice touch. There's nothing wrong with redeeming characters that are kind of shitty throughout like the, the run course of the, the movie. Yeah, I mean, he's kind of a dirtball, but he's not a possessed demon trying to murder anyone, and that's really the big threat here. And yeah, I think he genuinely, you know, he has a terrible way of showing it, but I think he likes Judy well enough. Yeah. And uh, so Roger has jumped off the roof. He's uh, on kind of this raised platform and is trying to get Judy to jump into his arms and she ends up falling. Um, And it's a nice kind of dolly shot of her falling. Um couple of other shots to point out before we kind of get to the end of this which we're barreling towards there's uh, some fun shots of angela floating down the hall oh dude i'm glad you brought that up because that is like one of my things that i like just thinking about it like sends a shiver up my spine and it all comes from the the original the house on haunted hill because it's got those couple shots of like the housekeeper that kind of yeah, just float like you can't see their legs moving. And it's like the simplest special effect in the world. Like they're literally just on like a mechanics like dolly or like a roller of some kind. And then you cover it with like a long dress or a skirt or something. And I don't know what it is about it. It's, just, it's one of those things that's like so unnatural. And you can tell that there's not like digital effects or like any optical effects really it's it's 100 practical and it looks so fucking unnatural and creeps me the hell out and it's also like a super i think traditional thing like when people talk about seeing ghosts or whatever is that they don't really like oh the ghost came walking up right to me i could hear his fucking kids clip clopping on the floor <laughs> no they usually don't have feet and they float that's that's like i think a ain't like a really really old kind of thing about ghosts that i think is pretty common which is also, <clears throat> it's like the opposite. My mom used to work in a lot of nursing homes. And <clears throat> I can't remember if this happened to her or somebody that she knew. But uh, she worked in this place that had uh, basically like a big dance hall in the basement. Like it's this massive, like, you know, old folks home type facility thing. <clears throat> and apparently like <clears throat> one of the night nurses or whatever heard, uh, I don't know, just some kind of commotion. And they went downstairs and into the where, where the old dance hall was. And all they could see was, like, a group of feet, like, you know, kind of bouncing around like they were dancing or something. No bodies, just feet, like shoes, old-timey shoes. And I'm pretty sure that was probably that nurse's last day there. And they said, fuck this, I'm going to go work at fucking, you know, Texas Roadhouse or whatever. But, uh, yeah, anyway, I figured I'd throw that in there. A little little ghost story for her her, uh, Halloween-related movie. Yeah, oh, I love a good ghost story. It's one of my favorite things is when someone's got a, like, hey, this happened to someone I know kind of ghost story. Love it. Dude, Love people it. that work in nurse, nursing home people, it seems like, have a lot of them. I mean, it's it, it's, it's, it's an obvious thing when you think about it. Cause, yeah, you know, people die left and right in nursing homes. That's basically why they go there is to live out the rest of their life and you know be cared for kind of or whatever so uh yeah i, I that this that seems a little underutilized in the horror genre is the haunted nursing home because like you talk to most nurses and stuff they're like fuck they're all haunted but probably well yeah you got nothing but dead people around so or uh-huh. dying people uh about that effect the floating effect it's even more low rent than you described because this was something that they did talk about in the commentary they, really? Yeah. They put her on roller skates and pushed her. <laughs> oh, perfect. I mean, it's kind of the same basic thing, yeah. They, they might have done the same thing at House on Haunted Hill, for all I know. I always just kind of assumed that it was, yeah, like a like a mechanics dolly, like they used to get on their back and get under your car kind of deal, or, you know, just a board with some fucking wheels on it. But I, this is the 80s, so yeah, yeah, I can pretty much guarantee at least a few of these people had roller skates in their closet at home. Yeah, it works super well. There's the one where you see her, like, the, the full body that's her on roller skates, and somebody just shoved her <laughs> down the hallway. And then right. the, the ones where you see her kind of waist up, 
was done with and that was where she was on like a, a dolly and they had the cameraman in a wheelchair pulling oh, okay. pulling all of that backwards um but yeah it, it's it's super effective and so judy falls on top of roger they're now trying to get away but again they can't get out because of this wall surrounding the joint so they end up going back through the first floor and down into the crematorium and that's where they find a demon head in the in the crematorium in the oven and uh outside the door of the crematorium the possessed pals of theirs have gathered and are banging on the door and they have to get out of this situation because Stooge and Angela and the rest of that ilk are s- slowly but surely forcing the door open like the, the screws are coming out of the hinges and stuff like that and they get the bright idea Judy and Roger do to basically pull the pipes away from the oven turn on the gas and then the lighter that she had earlier from when she was lighting candles she uses that to light the natural gas and turn it into a bit of a flamethrower so when (laughs) the demons come through the door she sets them on fire it's kind of goofy but you know it it does kind of make sense i mean it would never in a million years work in real life but you know it's it, it, it's a unique way to kind of dispatch our our our, and our bad guys at the end of the movie, kind of. So and it looks cool. You can you can get away with all kinds of shit as long as it looks cool. Yeah, and it's it's fun because we get to see some people set on fire, and that's never a bad thing. Um, and yeah, they kind of run past these burning demons and get past them, get outside, and to the brick wall again. And at this point, Roger manages to use some barbed wire to scale the wall and get at, to the top. Then he bring, uh, or is trying to drag Judy up and over as well. Um, while she is doing that, the demons, who are now all burned up, and actually the burn makeup, I think, looks real good, too. Yeah. Um, they kind of gather below Judy and are trying to pull her back uh, into their clutches and uh, before she can Judy can be pulled uh, down to be you know eaten or demoned or whatever Roger who had gone over the wall was like fuck this see you later <laughs> shows back up to uh, give her a hand and help her up and over the wall and then the sun comes up and uh, the demons all turn into smoke and we see the demon head again, and they've won. So, yay, our heroes! Did they, did they talk about on the commentary at all about like what was the like inspiration or anything like about the demon head? Because I'm I'm not remembering that. This, is Steve Johnson also worked on Ghostbusters, right? He Am absolutely did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, because I'm I'm looking at a little miniature terror dog from Ghostbusters, and I'm like, you know, the demon in Night of the Demons that like shows up in the mirror, and like at the end of this movie, kind of looks like a skeletal version of a terror dog, a little bit. A little bit. It was something that he had modeled, I think, and and so that might have been like you, you know, same same mama, different daddy kind of situation. Yeah. Um, but uh yeah i think it it comes off pretty well a a fun little fact about it is when you see the the sun coming up that is some stock footage that they they bought but uh they didn't have money to buy the clip and so the director kevin tenney worked out a deal with the stock footage company where they had filmed a boat exploding in the movie witchboard but they never (laughs) used it in the movie so they tra- okay. they traded stock footage where they got the sunrise and Kevin Tenney gave them the boat explosion. That's fucking wild. I, I would love to at some point stumble across the, the exploding boat from Witchboard that didn't get used and be like, hey, that's that. Yeah. Yeah. I thought that was real fun. But yeah. So um, yeah, there. Steve Johnson has some fun stories, mostly about him working on the night shoot and having to stay up late to do all the effects work 
and doing an ample amount of cocaine to keep away. Oh, yeah. Yeah, he's he's a character. There, there's a great episode, I think, of the Shockwaves podcast where they had Steve Johnson on. He talks about, like, uh, doing cocaine with the ghost of John Belushi when he designed Slimer for Ghostbusters. I think he's got a book out, too, and it's full of all these insane stories about being a special effects guy at, like, probably the height and like will always be you know the golden age of practical effects which is kind of the 80s uh late 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 70s to early 90s kind of was you know when dudes like these they were fucking rock stars back then same with like phil tippett and stan winston and these guys like they were absolutely at the top of their game and could like you know we're just making movies that like are, we're, we're still talking about all these years later and still love and adore so yeah um, like yeah. johnson worked for rick baker for a while and yeah i mean yeah. it's uh, yeah it, that group of wild men uh are just fascinating and just completely drug fueled which makes it even better as mythology i mean i'm sure they were just <laughs> nightmares to be around but yeah you know, it makes fun stories, that's for sure. Yeah, definitely. So, uh, our heroes start walking away from Hull House, and they pass by the home of the old dude that we saw earlier in the movie buying apples and razors. And when he sees them go by, he has a line that's something like, Oh, you filthy pig bastards, or something like that, which I really enjoy. Um, but he goes inside and his his wife is like, well, dear, I made you an apple pie. And, he, <laughs> and without any self-consciousness at all, he's just like, well, that sounds great. Have, cut me a slice of that apple pie. Starts eating it. And then uh, she's complaining like, I couldn't get any fresh apples at the store. So I just used the ones that you were going to hand out to the trick-or-treaters. And uh, as he's doing this, of course, razor blades just start ripping through his throat. And it's a, it's a gross effect, too. It's, it's this whole like front of his neck is just like tearing apart, basically. Yeah, one of one of the most expensive effects of the movie as it happens. And I, I, I can see that. Yeah, it's just again, it, it, it's a whole thing neck prosthetic and you're having to pull the razors through it and there's all the blood and yeah it a, a more complicated effect than a lot of the, the others i think i think the other one was the the lipstick was the other like big expensive effect yeah um, i mean yeah it's like a whole they probably had to do a cast of her whole torso that's like you know a day and a half two days just doing that part of it and then applying it is like half a day like a lot of it comes down to time like the materials and shit to build this stuff might not have been super expensive but you gotta pay somebody to do that and it takes a long time yeah as we learned uh, however Steve Johnson uh, was happily the volunteer to help make the cast of Linnea Quigley's uh, chest uh, no really they just took like a cast of his chest or something no oh, no no, no he, hers he applied, he he applied. applied. Oh, okay yeah, nah, yeah gotcha um, so he, he referred to it as a uh, love at first makeup effect. Um, <laughs> so, uh, the movie kind of ends with the, the old woman sipping her coffee and kissing the head of her husband who is bleeding it profusely from his throat. <laughs> and, and she says, happy Halloween, dear. So it's kind of a nice, you know, Halloween wrap up, uh, you know nodding to the holiday and so forth um but that's it that is that is the story such as it is of night of the demons pretty straightforward you get a bunch of kids in a, in a house demons start possessing them one by one and they try to get out you know there, there's a zillion movies like this but none quite like this movie this movie's kind of special i think it's it's got a lot going for it yeah, so let's get into that part of it. Uh, let's talk about some of the performances. And I'll, I'll start with Amelia Kincaid as Angela, who I think is okay until she gets possessed, and then she's amazing. Right. I, I, I think, think she's, she's, kind of, she's kind of appealing, like, before she gets possessed. I don't know. She's, like, not quite, like 
you kind of get the impression that like Linnea Quigley's character is like the wild one of those two. Like maybe she's like a little more like a bad kid kind of, or is like, I think like it, uh, uh, like Angela's character before she gets possessed kind of on a base level reminds me of like the main character in Pie Whack It. She's not mm-hmm. really like a bad kid. She's just into spooky shit and she likes dressing in black and like, that was kind of like that, that was the style back then when that was like a fairly relatively you know fresh and new thing and there's still kids like that like you know Biwaka was only made a couple years ago and it's featured features a like similar kind of characters this is a goth kid basically and uh, I don't know I always appreciate movies when that's not done super stereotypically because to a degree I was that kind of kid and I also knew a lot of kids that were like that there were not necessarily bad kids. We were just into spooky shit. I don't know. Some of us had, you know, our problems like every kid does or whatever. But like, you know, like clearly Angela is not above like just shoplifting like fucking crazy or like probably breaking and entering into private property because there's no way in hell the whole house is just like, you know, open. Like, I, I don't know. Is there a shot of them like opening the gate? I forget. Or like, I feel like there should have been a shot somewhere of them. Uh, it's definitely implied that they break into this fucking place. So yeah. I mean, she's 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 no angel, but uh, deep down, I think she's a you know she's she's a good kid. Yeah, she's a good kid. Um, she's a good kid. Go get your sister. Yeah. Speaking of Billy Gallo, the guy who played Sal, uh, I he is a performer in this movie that really sticks out to me. Um, because he is playing that kind of dirtbag guy, but I think he's actually very funny in it. Um, yeah, he's he's got some some of the best lines of dialogue I think in this. I don't know, he's he's and yeah, he he he's got the look, he's got the voice. It's a bad Italian stereotype, sure, but he's also like kind of I think going for like a greaser thing, and uh, he, he's he's kind of like the evil Fonz. And this is another character that you like see in a bazillion uh, bazillion movies, especially like where like. In another movie, the, the kid brother would have been the main character, and you know the the, the shitty boyfriend is kind of the antagonist. You know what kind of reminds me to is Terror Vision with uh, whatever the hell the the sister's doofy fucking punk rock boyfriend that keeps threatening <laughs> to beat up the little kid is. I can't remember what the hell his name is. It's been a bit since I've seen Terror Vision, yeah, but it's kind of the same thing there. A while, yeah. Uh, but yeah, and I but I think he's fun. I think he kind of gets what that character is and and really leans into it. And I think the same thing is true of uh, Hal Havens, who plays Stooge. Um, I think he understands like I'm just going to be ridiculously over the top and unlikable <laughs> because hearing the guy talk, it's like oh, this, he seems like a very smart, funny guy, and him playing just a complete, you know you know party monster just looking to get drunk and laid kind of thing it's it's fun and he goes full out like they tried to get him to uh moon that old man to show his bare ass and uh he was like you can't afford that i'm not showing my (laughs) not showing my big ass on screen man (laughs) yeah his his costume is perfect too because i mean he's he he is a pig. His character is yeah a male pig. So uh, yeah, it's, it's kind of it's kind of kind of brilliant stuff. And yeah, he's 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 just a lot of fun to watch. Like even though he's super obnoxious and crude, I, I genuinely enjoy watching him in this movie. Yeah, he's really fun. Um, and we talked about Linnea Quigley, who just kind of owns it, and uh, she's very creepy. Uh, you know, Linnea Quigley is Linnea Quigley. You know kind of what she's going to bring to your film, aside from yep. just the, the nudity. But also she has a very measured way of talking, you know. Uh, that, that I find it most uh, pointed in, like, Return of the Living Dead. But she has that, that very enunciated delivery where every word is very important you know um, yeah. it, it, it's an interesting delivery style and and nobody else sounds like her in that scream queen kind of uh collection of actresses um and i, I i'm a big fan i like i like it when linnea quickly shows up in something 
Because A, oh, yeah. she's probably going to get naked, and B, she's not going to be a pushover. You know, because I she never is in these movies. Yeah, I I hate to say it, but I mean, I, I big time grew up on Return of the Living Dead. That was a movie that I've probably seen fucking hundreds of times at this point and as a teenager. Like, I think that maybe to a degree shaped you know <laughs> she's just got like such a badass attitude in that movie and yeah like you said like she just takes shit from nobody and like i respect that so much it's, it's like a super like you know even though she gets butt naked through like a good chunk of that movie i think it's kind of a you know pro-feminine role because she's you know just well i don't know she it's, it's hard to say i i feel weird talking about pro-feminine things as well doofy white male that you know sure yeah, really yeah. know much about these things but uh de- definitely uh shaped i think personally my my taste in women to a degree yeah and uh i think kind of lastly for me uh kathy podwell as judy is i again i think kind of what you need her to be in this movie which is very sweet very innocent can look scared when you need her to be and yeah. and it's not a complicated performance or anything, but I also she is totally right for that part. She looks she's very sweet faced and all that, and um, yeah, I think she is. You know, this is damning with faint, faint praise a little bit, but like I think she is totally fine in this. But also, when you're surrounded by like Amelia Kincaid having a ball as Angela and Linnea Quigley pushing lipstick into her boobs. It's just hard to stand out in that crowd. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah, like you said, she, she's she's necessary because she's kind of our center, uh, you know, as far as, like, the character dynamics in this goes. She's, I think, kind of going to be the character that the audience relates to the most just because everybody is, like, you know, somewhere between a wacky caricature or just like a weird quirky, quirky kind of character. We we need somebody that's like kind of normal that the audience can relate to. And yeah, it's kind of Judy in this one. Yeah. So anybody else you want to call out uh, as far as performances go? I think that's, I, I mean, I think that's about it. And like, yeah, this is one of those great movies where like you can, like it's it's great for the actors because they basically get most of them get to play two parts they get to play you know their normal character or or whatever and then they get to play possessed character and i think everybody in this movie does a really good job of like you know uh acting like you know some of them are kind of possessed and some of them are like a little bit more like zombies like they don't really get a whole lot to do but uh definitely yeah uh possessed stooge and angela are like fairly iconic they, they just released a blu-ray of this a year or two ago that uh screen factory packaged and a couple of action figures of those too and i didn't get a chance to snag those and now they go on ebay for like 300 bucks but there's like so like anybody that's seen this movie would know like if you just showed them those two characters basically like you they, they know what movie this is from it's, it's maybe not on the level of like you know jason Voorhees iconic but uh fairly iconic and like i think you know miles above a lot of the you know possessed by a demon kind of movies because there's a zillion of these in the 80s like like i said there's movies just like this only like a million times shittier kind of depending on how you're doing it so um yeah uh i i I, that's kind of one of the cooler things about this movie i think all right well let's uh discuss themes which won't take long because this is not a particularly deep film Um, you know, it's not like coming off the psycho series where it's like, well, you know, this is really a movie about the idea of escaping your past. And, you know, uh, this is more like, I don't know, don't fuck around with black magic, I guess. And also don't put razors in apples. Don't be, don't be an old man asshole. Um, I, if I were going to be, if like, if I had to write a thesis on this movie, I would probably go with a lot of the Wonderland stuff of like, this is kind of about a girl who descends into this madhouse and tries to escape it, you know? Like, suddenly, we were talking about it earlier, like the rules of physics don't quite apply in this world the way that it does elsewhere, you know, outside right. the walls of all else. And and so that's probably the underlying theme of the film, is is this notion of like being being thrust into a world of insanity and and finding your way out of it but like i said it's not 
this isn't a movie that's trying to make you learn something about the human condition, you know? No, but there, there's just enough of it there that, like, if you went looking for it, kind of like we just did, I mean, it is there, but it's not, you know, 100% necessary to the plot or anything. Yeah, you could just enjoy this, like, completely on surface level, and I, yeah, I think it's just as good that way, too. So, um, yeah, I, I think a lot of better horror movies out of the 80s kind of kind of share that with it, where if you want to get real deep about it, you can, but you absolutely don't have to. Yeah, yeah, and and... So that brings us to uh, final thoughts on the film. And here, I'm just going to turn it over to you first, and then I'll I'll <clears> piggyback <throat> on yours by saying ditto. I I love this movie. It had been a couple of years since I'd seen it. I kind of had forgotten that this was a Halloween related movie. Like I remembered everything else about it, but I didn't remember its like connections to Halloween. This has re- we didn't mention the opening credits to this, which is this kind of cool animated style where it's like on a black background it reminded me of like it reminded me of two things it reminded me of batman the animated series which is like kind of notorious because it was one of the first cartoons that's animated completely on black backgrounds just to give it that kind of like negative space like noirish kind of look and it also reminded me i'm looking right at it actually i have this old edgar Allan poe book that's a lot of like uh it's, it's, it's from like the 30s. I think it's the oldest book I own. It's an illustrated copy. And it's like just full of these awesome like crosshatch kind of, I think that's what that art style is referred to. But um, it's uh, it, it reminded me a lot of that. And yeah, it's, it's all Halloween themes, you know, like spooky black cats and pumpkins and stuff. And like, as soon as I like put this on, I was like, oh man, this is such a great movie to be watching like a week before Halloween. Like this is... Uh, definitely needs to go in your your seasonal rotation around this time but uh yeah it had been a couple years since i'd seen this and like yeah i I remember really liking this you know who really loves this movie is danny trioc and over on the the now defunct midnight horror show this movie was like super duper his jam back in the day and i know quite a few other people that this is like way up there on like some of their favorite like horror movies of all time basically and uh yeah i i I think this one is for me definitely going in my yearly rotation around halloween i'm gonna grow to love it more i think this is only like the second or third time i've seen this one because i definitely remember seeing this back in my early 20s or so and then again kind of when we were doing like halloween shows for the midnight horror show but uh yeah this is a a strong recommend This, this is on shutter right now so this is really easy to get i don't know if you're gonna have that kind of luck with a lot of the sequels, if they're equally as easy to get, but yeah, there's oh, also no. like a nah, I didn't think so. Yeah, there, there's a pretty nice. I don't know if it's out of print or not, but there was like a pretty nice uh, Scream Factory Blu-ray of this floating around. It's got a whole bunch of special features. I might need to track that down here at some point because uh, yeah, this, this, this belongs in your collection. Now, hopefully, you've seen this. If you listen to us, just like spoil the shit out of it over the last hour and a half or so. But if for some reason you listen to all this and you haven't, you need to get off your ass and go watch this movie because it's 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 really good. It's one definitely one of the better ones that came out of the eighties. Yeah, it's kind of of that ilk that were spawned by the Evil Dead of like let's put a bunch of kids in a siege kind of scenario and have them start getting possessed. Right. And but it is as you said, it is one of the better versions of that. Um, it's low budget for sure. Um, in on paper, it should be completely unremarkable, but it's got some really good and interesting performances in it. It's got great, great camera work and lighting. Um, the atmosphere really works. The practical effects are better than most of these movies by a wide stretch. And, and it's also got a nice quick runtime. You want to warm my heart? You come in at like 89 minutes with a movie like this, and now we got something. Because you're not, you're not overstaying your wel- welcome. The action kind of keeps moving and keeps propelling forward throughout the film. Um, and I like all of that stuff. It's, you know, my big complaints with it are that it is a single location movie. And... I, like I'm not I don't get bored with it or anything but there there is part of me that's like I feel like this is just kind of cramped and small and claustrophobic but again it was also made for about a million dollars so 
but yeah, I you know I've got my my minor quibbles with it, but I remember watching this when I when I was a kid. I was talking about this when I was doing the thirty one days of Halloween stuff for for Legion. I talked about the movie Evil Dead and how when I was a kid, the first time I saw that, that scared the living shit out of me. And I kind of get that vibe in this movie too, where there is something about being trapped in a place where the people that you knew are now trying to kill you and you can't get out that really like strikes a chord somewhere in my spinal column that creeps me out uh, in a way that a lot of horror movies don't. And right. yeah, this movie kind of gets under my skin at times, which is weird because it is, it, it's kind of knowingly funny and campy at times, but is also really unnerving at times too. Like with the lipstick thing and stuff of like, this is just kind of gross and weird and uncomfortable. Yeah, yeah, it's 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 a lot of little things. I think like yeah, just just, just lurking just beneath the surface. Like, like I was talking about the not being able to find the gate thing and being lost like indoors or whatever. It's yeah, it's uh, it's it, it, it's it's got enough spooky stuff in it that like uh, you, I think you're willing to overlook some of the, the limitations and budget or whatever that they had and why why it sort of stands above a lot of other stuff. It, it gets just enough right that like a lot of movies get super duper wrong and don't really have a whole lot to offer you know like this this one's got plenty and it, it does it all uh, uh well, well above average i think is what i, I, was, I would call it yeah yeah i that's kind of where i land with it speaking of let's do some ratings uh we do uh, a five star rating system you are allowed half stars but we don't do quarter stars because we're not monsters <laughs> okay so um i i would I, this is a pretty like solid four star movie for me. Like I, I wouldn't call this like a masterpiece or anything because uh, you know it's 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 kind of cheesy in an eighties way and yeah, like you said, it's it's kind of limited in its locations and what it can do on its budget kind of stuff. But uh, I just on, just on a personal level, I really like this movie. This this ticks a lot of my boxes. So this is like a solid four out of five for me. Excellent. I'm gonna go a little below that uh, at three and a half. I think, as we talked about, it's a well above average movie, and I think some of the characters get a little lost in the mix of this. Uh, so, you know, they're really just cannon fodder for the rest of the film, but for all the reasons that we talked about before, the great camera work and the lighting and iconic scenes like the lipstick nipple and Angela dancing and stooge and all that stuff. It's yes, as you said, Mark, uh, quite succinctly, this belongs in a Halloween rotation. You should watch this movie around Halloween. Um, so before I cut you loose, here are three things that you may not know about Night of the Creep or Night of the Creeps, Night of the Demons. <laughs> Sweet. Uh, yeah, I, we're just going to give you three random facts about Night of the Creeps. Uh, it has nothing to do with anything we talked about before. I just like throwing Night of the Creeps uh, <laughs> trivia in. No, no, no. <laughs> Three things that you you might not know about uh, Night of the Demons. One, the original script contained a gay couple and an interracial kiss, but some of the producers were like, uh, look, we're not doing that. But Ooh. yeah, it was a, like a super progressive uh, screenplay. Um, which kind of a, a bummer that that didn't make it in there. Um, eh, the eighties were not terribly progressive in a lot of ways. Oh, for sure. Um, also Linnea Quigley and Steve Johnson, when they met during the application of goo to her breast to make the mold fell in love and were later married for a couple of years after doing this movie. Oh Yeah. That's kind of nice. Nice. that's kind of nice. <laughs> yeah, and <laughs> and the last one is uh, one that uh, we briefly referenced, which is the animated sequence at the beginning. Originally, was not going to be the open of the movie. Uh, Kevin Tenney wanted to do a live action open to the film, but uh, one of the uh, producers was so insistent on it that they ended up doing a mock-up of like a couple of minutes or a couple of quick black and white panels of what the opening would look like. And even though it, it cost way more than the opening that Kevin Tenney was going to do. And again, money was a big uh, issue on this shoot. 
uh, after seeing just a couple of uh, a, a couple of seconds of this opening uh, animated, he was like, "Oh right, okay, that's what we should do." Um, so that's interesting, and yeah, I, I kind of forget that back in the day, yeah, animation was really expensive and like even you know finding companies or individuals that could do that kind of thing was a lot harder back then now like everybody and their grandma has like blender and is like an expert in like you know animation and 3d modeling and stuff like that like it's just uh, the tables have super turned well and the technology has become like so much more readily available to do that now than it was back in the 80s like i i I guess that kind of makes sense but now i'm kind of curious what he had originally planned like kind of roughly the same thing only done live action like some tim burton you know whipping through the town there's pumpkins and spooky shit like that kind of deal now now i'm kind of curious what they had originally planned yeah my impression was that it was just going to be either kind of a cold open the way that that night the demons 2 happens or that it was just like hey we're gonna roll credits over this car ride um, no, okay. So, at any rate, those are, are three things that you, you may or may not know about Night of the Demons. Hopefully, uh, you leave this show a little smarter than when you found it. And <laughs> um, also, certainly, with more knowledge about uh, necrophilia. Um, <laughs> yes. So, man, Mark, uh, thanks again. Uh, it We've been needing to do something like this for a while, and I really appreciate you uh taking some time and checking out night of the demons again so that we could chit chat about it and uh with that said people will want to hear more from you so where can they do that uh yeah man Th- thanks for having me on this this was a great pick because yeah, i really like this movie and i kind of forgotten how much i like this movie so yeah this is this is a good one to finally get you and me in the the same digital room to talk about uh so you can find me over on the doing the nasty podcast that's at uh tputzcast.com uh as in the podcast center the stairs cast.com uh the, the all all of the other uh side i, I keep calling them side shows which makes it sound like a fucking circus or something which <laughs> somebody to a degree so this, some so, of them kind of are <laughs> Somebody's biting the head off a chicken on one of these shows. <laughs> I'm over here swallowing swords and fucking shooting a cannon at somebody's guts. Mm-hmm. Uh, but yeah, it, it's 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 all the, the 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 shows that come under the banner of the podcast under the stairs that aren't the podcast under the stairs. Uh, there's there's Opera Omnia, which you were on a whole bunch. You were on the David Fincher ones, right? Yeah, yeah. We're still working our way through that. I gotta uh, watch <laughs> Girl with the Dragon Tattoo here in a, in a day or two okay well you guys are yeah you're you're well halfway through through his stuff i i did listen to the fight club in the seven episodes a while back and i really enjoyed those because those, those are definitely two movies that were hugely influential to me as like a teenager back when they originally kind of came out so yeah definitely go check those out if you are, are, are looking for some uh, post halloween non no horror stuff to listen to podcasts about um, but yeah, the doing the nasties over there. I think I think there's about 22 episodes of that out. There's another one about to drop here pretty soon with two kind of. It was a fun episode to record, but they're two kind of boring movies that we talked about. We did um, Jesus Christ, I, they're, they're so boring. I've already forgot what the hell they're called. Um, uh, anyway, the, the the one that's coming up next is kind of one I'm a little bit more excited about. We're, we're going to be talking about in insem- an insemnioid. Oh uh, yeah, yeah, which is. It's a super bonkers alien ripoff from the 80s that's uh, really gross and uh, kind of deserved to be at least on the, the lesser video nasty list. And the other one that's on there is a movie that I had never heard of called The Last Hunter, which I basically described as kind of like a Fulci directed platoon. It's, I think, the only war movie that's on at least the tier three video nasty list. It's fucking insane. It's got a lot of cast members that. Uh, made their way through like a lot of the Italian directors stuff. I can't remember who the director on this was. It wasn't anybody um, that I had. It was somebody that did a bunch of a bunch of Italian cannibal movies around the same time. But it, it's about Vietnam soldiers. It's super violent and fucked up. Both those movies are on YouTube if you want to go check them out. And they're pretty okay prints on there. I think Insemnioid is also Amazon Prime. But uh, yeah, find me over there. Uh, I, I do all kinds of guest appearances. I, I, I show up on the Psycho Semantic cast pretty frequently. Uh, Darren and I just did that uh, kind of side project for Psycho Semantic that's all about comic book movies. Um, I think that's still just on the 
Legion Patreon. So definitely be sure and go. It's it's a couple bucks a month or whatever to subs- to subscribe to the Legion Patreon. You, you can find that Captain America show. We were we were trying really hard to get one done for October. That would be kind of like a little more. We break away from the Marvel movies and do uh, something a little spookier, like a comic book movie. Uh, I don't know if we're going to have time for that. So we'll probably be back in November with the, the next installment of that that show, which uh, it was a lot of fun to do because I invariably almost always end up on podcasts about like horror and exploitation stuff. So it's kind of fun to do like a mainstream uh, Hollywood comic book movie that, that has nothing to do with horror or any of that. It's, it's outside the box for me. Um, I think that's about it. Yeah, the, the, like keep it. If, if you follow me on Twitter, it's at the Fancy Mark. I always talk about my uh, podcast projects uh, over there. So yeah, if you want to hear from more from me, that's probably your best bet. Is just follow me on Twitter, and I will definitely let you all know where I end up on the, on the interwebs as far as podcasts. So. The Fancy Mark, indeed. Uh, all right, buddy, uh, and I will be right back to close out the show. Thanks again, man. Yeah, man. And there you have it, ladies and gentlemen. That is my conversation with Mark Ball about Night of the Demons. Uh, again, I thought it was a great time, and and thanks once more to Mark Ball for coming on and making that happen. Uh, so, a couple of uh, housekeeping notes here on the end of things. Uh, be sure, if you haven't already done so, please uh, subscribe to The Dark Parade on your podcast catcher of choice. Uh, also, if you happen to have an iTunes account, if you would... Be so kind as to leave us a rating and review over there on iTunes. That certainly helps uh, raise the profile of the show. And honestly, the best thing you can do is just share it around. Like if you're enjoying the show, uh, post it on your feed or send it to a friend of yours that also likes horror movies. Anything uh, that you can do to uh, to help us elevate the show to its rightful place of power in the horror podcasting world. I appreciate it. Uh, thanks for all the feedback. You, please join me over on Meta or Facebook or whatever the hell they're calling it now. There's uh, the group, The Dark Parade, and that is where I tend to be the most active. You know, just commenting about different movies and sharing some Halloween decorations and all kinds of fun stuff. So uh, hop over there, say hi. You can also catch me on Twitter at uh, Dark Parade Pod. And, uh, and of course, uh, I encourage you to subscribe to Legion Podcast where you get this show and everything else I do along with a number of other great creators. So drop us a line over there as well. Um, that is it until next week when we will be talking about Night of the Demons 2 with very special guest Gary Hill. Have yourselves a great week. Uh, we'll see you next time on The Dark Parade. <laughs>